Sorry. I, I hate being wedded to a, uh, a podium. Good evening. Uh, this is the legal aspects of computer network aggressive self-defense. Our agenda. We're going to talk about the aspects of uh, active response, self-defense, self-help, um, and things like that. And we're going to look into some scenarios that go along with that. The disclaimer, I am a member of the Armed Services, and I am here in a personal capacity. Uh, this comes from the Joint Ethics Rag. It's wonderful reading, um, if you have ethics in government and you believe that. Um, the, uh, here, all my errors rely with me. This is my personal presentation. It has uh, no view from the Department of Defense or the Department of the Army, and so there's the disclaimer. I am Major Robert Clark. I am the legal advisor for the Army's First Information Operations Command. As part of that, uh, I am the legal advisor for the Computer Network Operations Division, which contains the Army's Computer Emergency Response Team. So that's how I got tied into doing this computer and internet uh, legal aspect, uh, aspect of life. I find it very fascinating. And the fun aspect is I get to learn as much of the technical stuff as I can possibly grasp with my one megabyte hard drive that's in my head. Uh, I've tried to expand it, it's just not working. And the alcohol keeps erasing things, and I, so. Again, there's that disclaimer again. Uh, I'm not your lawyer. I'm at the present not DOD's lawyer or the Department of the Army's lawyer. I'm up here personally doing this. With that in mind, um, about me, uh, you can very easily make me look stupid in this presentation because I'm going to try to go and deal with a lot more technical aspects of strike back technology and kind of the legal ramifications of it. So if you want to make me look stupid, that's going to be easy. Um, if you want to help out, please do, but I'm not going to cut my speaking fee with you. Uh, I'm going to keep that. I might buy you a drink, but, but we'll go on that one later. One of the aspects, I, I'm curious here, how many people saw my other pitch that I did uh, a year in review? All right, um, at that one you heard some things um, which are up here. Facts are king, and that's the important aspect when you're getting into this, this area. If you're doing this or thinking about doing this, um, which is an interesting aspect, I met with uh, uh, the publisher for, or one of the reps from Singress Publishing and we were talking about getting together to do a book on legal aspects of aggressive network self-defense. And we said it'd be great if we could find somebody in the financial institution who would anonymously step forward, but at least come up with things that are actually being done so we could write about that and get the hook into people wanting to read it instead of dealing with hypotheticals. Um, this area, by the way, if you have questions, please pipe up. If you want to go in a different direction, in a different scenario, please pipe up because I have no problem getting off of script with this because, again, this is uh, one of those areas where I wish I had a better grasp on the technical aspects of it. We'll go through it and try to, uh, try to hopefully grasp these right. If you're dealing in this area and you're dealing with your general counsel or legal counsel or attorneys in, in general, You've got to explain this in excruciating detail. For those of you who call my other act, I apologize for repeating myself. But you're going to have to explain this to your attorney at a third grade level. And the reason is so they can understand it, because they're going to have to take this and explain it to somebody at a first grade level. So that's kind of how it works in the legal profession. The other aspect, if you're dealing in this, you've got to get lawyers who are dealing with computer and internet security. They are few and far between. You just can't look in the phone book and pick one and go over and say, hey, I need some representation. Oh, yeah, I'll be glad to do it because they're not going to know about the Electronic Communication Privacy Act and all the different things, like the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act and all the other statutes that kind of play into this. So by all means, you've got to find some lawyers who specialize in this. Um, Another aspect I said about my previous slide, and this is because you know the guys who saw my you know, and gals who saw my previous pitch, all my good jokes are gone, so I apologize about that. Um, but it is kind of a small take on that. Um, I said this at the other one: computer and internet security law is unsettled. There are very few precedents out there. We're trying to develop them as we go. And at the other one, I said, therefore, I wanted to give some really good, sound advice, that something that you take back, and some of you have already seen it. 
part of it was we're in the desert, so wear sunscreen. It's a proven fact that sunscreen will prevent skin cancer, and that's very important. Well, there's one thing I, I should have probably said. If you're at the pool and you're under a tree, if you can look at my face, my face and my body is the same color right now. I was under a tree all day today, and I didn't know that you need to put sunscreen on even when you're under a goddamn tree because you'll still get burned. So now, better legal advice. We're in the desert, wear sunscreen, and if you're under a tree in shade, still put the sunscreen on. It will help you a lot. Something else I'm curious about. It's 8 p.m. What the hell are you people doing here? Uh, you know, and, and you know, that's true. This is early for you. This is classic. I was at an NSA conference, and we had some guys from EI up, and it was like 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and they're talking about doing an analysis of some Microsoft patches that came out. And again, I'm, I'm learning, and they were doing the analysis. Four patches were released, but in the, the code that came out, were like four others that Microsoft didn't tell anybody about, and they're breaking them apart and going, the guy's yawning, and, and he goes, I'm sorry, this is really early for me. And we're like, yeah, it's two in the afternoon. And it's like, this is getting late for me. I need my nap. So yeah, you're right. This is, this is still early for you guys. And, uh, and so I do see, I realize that. But I am curious. Um, always know your audience um, and who you're working on. And I'm wondering, by a show of hands, who's operating on the, one of the three major food groups right now? One being alcohol. Caffeine and and sugar and, and all three. Yeah, that's what. I, that's, let me say that was law school, folks. That was law school. I'm being paused. Did you notice I didn't move while he paused me? I was trying to do that technical thing, but self-defense. Um, everybody kind of understands the aspect of self-defense. You, you know it from the physical world aspect of threats that you face. Um, you can you know, exercise reasonable force when you find yourself threatened uh, on that has to be proportionate to the threat, um, which is always the classic, you know, it's the you know, little girl coming up and saying, you know, give me your wallet and you pull out an AK-47 and blow her away. You know, it's not quite proportional to the threat there. You got to keep it proportional to the threat that you're facing. Personal property can also be defended uh, on that one. But again, it has to be reasonable in what we are doing. The difference between self-defense and self-help has a little bit of a kicker to it. Self-help has an element of retrieving something that was yours under the doctrine of trespass to chattel. Um, Intel versus Hamadi was, I'm sure, uh, I hope most of you have heard about it. Uh, good old Mr. Hamadi was, you know, peppering Intel with uh, thousands of emails to their employees um, on it, and they brought a trespass to chattel case. And one of the aspects of, of the things that said in this case was that trespass to chattel and the law that deals with it really favors prevention over pre uh, post-trespass recovery. Um, and it said, you know, reasonable force to retain possession is okay, but after possession has been lost, not so much. Well, that kind of went against a lot of case law that was out there that said, no, you know, reasonable force can be used after I lose my property to retrieve it. Um, it has to be reasonable. And typically what we're talking about is, if you're doing this in the physical world, it's, it's not breaching the peace, um, which, you know, the thing that everyone thinks is, okay, my neighbor borrowed my lawnmower and I want to go back to get it. It's the middle of the night. I hop the fence, go in there, grab it, open his gate, and out I go, and I haven't breached the peace. You know, now if your neighbor's a paranoid asshole and you open the gate and lights and sirens are going off and floodlights come on and you're grabbing the damn lawnmower and he's got there with a shotgun and you're going to take a buck in your ass, um, that might breach the peace and you may want to rethink it. So that's kind of the standard we're looking at when we're talking about a self-help standard for doing this. We take from the legal world physical cases and try to parlay them into virtual cases. Um, I saw this case and you're thinking, how the hell did uh, an abortion protest end up with any kind of relevance to this? But it does tie in to our warped legal minds. And again, that's what you have to deal with when you're talking to lawyers. 
uh, guy had a sign, he was out there protesting, and the clinic director didn't like it, went out there, grabbed the sign, and brought it into the clinic. So the protester walked into the clinic to retrieve his sign and left with a sign. And he was charged with a trespass on this criminally. Well, he was not convicted because they said he had the right to go in there, retrieve his property. He thought it was going to be destroyed. He did it with a reasonable amount of force, didn't elevate, it was proportional. He did it quickly, within 90 seconds of it going in there, and out he went. Okay, so the reason that kind of kicks in uh, my mind is the aspect of, you know, what happens if trade secrets are stolen and taken somewhere? Documents, things of this nature. What can you do to retrieve your property? And how fast do you have to act? So that's one of the things that kind of comes into a legal mind. One of the other aspects that we deal with are some of the standards that are out there, expectations to privacy, and that special skill aspect that we talked about before. The special skill is going to kind of come in when I'm being hacked and individuals are retrieving things and bad things are happening to their systems. What's my liability in an active response? Am I allowed to attribute to them special skills so that when they grab something off my box, I shouldn't be liable? So that's one of some of the cases that we look at when we're dealing with this. Reality. Um, the aspects of this is very simple. Right now, there are kind of four level or two levels that you need to worry about in dealing with reality. Criminal charges and civil charges. This is a defense. If you do an active response, you could possibly not only be prosecuted by DOJ because they don't need a victim, the state and the government's a victim, and you can also be sued. Now, one thing you need to know about being sued first thing you need to know if you're going to do this is, do you have any money? If you have no money, then what the hell does it matter if you're civilly sued? You haven't got anything. So the first thing the lawyer is going to say is, who do you want to sue? Joe Hacker. Does he have any money? No. Get out of my office. <laughs> it's a pretty simple thing. So that's one of the considerations. If you have no money, knock at it, follow that active response, you'll be all set. What a lot of the, the law review articles that are dealing with self-defense, active defense are talking about is they're trying to break down those two things into four things. You got your criminal and your civil charges, and they're trying to come up with a privileged exception or a defense to both of those. So you'd have four things to look at. Um, civilly, you might have a real good chance of seeing that happen. Criminally, um, there's a three-letter agency that's headquartered in just north of Northern Virginia, just south of Maryland, um, that does not want to go down that path probably. Um, they are not very big fans of active response. Um, and a lot of the law review articles that you see written about this is, good God, we're going to be back to the Wild West with everybody <laughs> shooting at everybody else. And, and we hear that a lot. Um, and so that's kind of one of the other aspects you see. And again, there's that damn disclaimer. Because everything I talk about here, again, my previous pitch, when you ask a lawyer a question um, and start talking to him about things, the first thing personally I like to hear out of his or her mouth is, you know, it depends. Uh, it's kind of a standard, you know, joke for us. You know, you ask an engineer or a mathematician what's one plus one, and they'll give you a whole analysis about integers and positives and negatives. And they'll say, but if you're talking about a positive one and a positive one, that's usually two. If you ask a lawyer what's one plus one, typically they say, you know, what do you want it to be? Um, <laughs> and, and so that's kind of the aspect of it depends. Um, when you're dealing in this area and you start asking questions, you want your lawyer to be asking you a lot of questions to break it down because, again, facts are king and that's the thing that we're working on. The scenarios. Um, this is not a, a, a shameless plug because I have absolutely nothing to do with Singress Publishing. I asked them if I could use their scenarios from their book and they said yes. And so I thank them for the permission they granted me to use their scenarios from here. Uh, because as a lawyer, I need to get into some technical, uh, you know, and, 
and if this is like at the technical level of a comic strip, I apologize, but you know, if it, that's where my brain works. If it's more technical, then I guess I'm doing kind of good if I can grasp some of this. Um, and the reason I use this is because when you talk about an active response and you get lawyers in the room, we always seem to jump to the worst case scenario. You know, I'm getting hacked, God damn it, I'm pissed off, they're in my system, I'm going to fire back and melt the machine. And, and the first thing the lawyer will say is, how do you know that's not a server that is running a hospital and when you fire back it's going to bring the entire hospital down, someone's going to be at the operating table having his appendix removed and everybody's going to die and dogs and cats will be living together and we'll have mass hysteria. <laughs> and you know, that's typically how we go. So the reason I wanted to go with this is because I wanted to get to attribution. I didn't want attribution to be a problem. Um, although, there's some aspects when I get into these scenarios of am I hitting an innocent third party's box when that's where the attack's coming from, there are some legal aspects to that and, and we might touch upon that. And again, if you want to go off script and go in a different area, please let me know and we will go there uh, for that. I, uh, I, a bunch of guys, some, some friends of mine are, are at this conference and they came in here and they're staying up in the Bellagio. There's like 10 of them up in a suite. I've never seen you know, so much goddamn electronics in my life. Um, I've seen some pictures of some busts that DOJ have done where like entire sections are wired and, and everything's going off. And of course, everybody now has got, you know, their little PDAs, which, you know, apparently, you know, could launch Apollo 13 with enough processing power that's there. So clearly these are devices that qualify under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act for uh, a, a computer device on this. The scenario in this one was written by Seth uh, Foggy, um, and again, it was hopefully kind of semi-simple so I could understand it. And the way it works is the guy rides the metro into DC all the time, and he, he, he likes to get into these, you know, uh, Wi-Fi or wireless games played there. And, you know, if he doesn't have the game, you know, it's broadcast out there, they download it which kind of goes into that aspect of, you know, if you're in this business and you've got that special skill, if someone's going to offer you something, you know, what's the liability if all of a sudden you've got a keylogger on your system? I mean, are you just going to sit there and blindly put something on your own stuff? Uh, but that would, you know, kind of end our simple, our example here if I said, you know, he's, you know, has no defense. And that's what happens here. He gets a nice little uh, uh, Trojan put on his device here and he discovers it because he, he notices there's a, a reduction in the RAM going on. So he does the forensics on it to find it, and he finds Bob Server Execute, which is a backdoor FTP. My name's Bob. Whatever, what the hell, why is it always when you log into an anonymous FTP, it's Bob at AOL? I, 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 I couldn't figure that out. Everyone's like, I'm like, how did Bob get to be the asshole in this? But what the hell. Um, what is it? Um, so he does the forensics on this and the scenario is interesting because he feels violated, um, he wants revenge. Now, he's got an unknown attack. What the hell is going to happen if he goes to the cops and says, hey, on my, on my system here, my device, I got this virus that came in, I don't know who gave it to me, what the hell should I do? You know, cops, underpaid, overworked, they're going to say there's a public clinic down the road, go get a shot of penicillin in your ass, get out the door. They're not going to understand what's going on. So what can he do? Now, he can, in my mind, go on out and start doing a little forensics to find out where this came from because this is a threat. If it happened to him, it could be happening to other people. And if this guy's out there getting access to PDAs, you know, you're starting to download a lot of information off of there, especially with the, the amount of processing and information these things can hold. So you're talking about Again, think of our typical users, not our special skills folks. Our folks that have got their pocket quicken on there, their financial records. You know, in their address book, they say my PIN number, or uh, it says PIN, so they can remember it. Um, their credit cards, all their flight information, you know, the, the, all the information that could possibly be in there, the typical users might put in there, this actually could be kind of dangerous. So he's going to go out and learn the identity of this individual, and at that point in the book it says he's going to learn the identity and cause severe data loss. Now, right up to that point with that two-phase attack, if you're going to learn the identity, hey, this is kind of self-defense. I can kind of understand it because he's going to keep riding the metro and he wants to find out what happened. It's the severe data loss that's going to start getting him in a little bit of trouble. So, he's going to look for a reverse attack on this to do that. Um, 
And again, that's the part that I'm concerned about. Um, he wants to do a trick the guy into downloading a file, and it's going to con uh, contain a hard reset is what he wants to do um, to go with this. So phase one, the reverse engineering, and that's what we're going to do. The reverse engineering he wants to do is he wants to have something that's going to alert him when it happens. Um, he wants to protect his files, and he wants basically the attacker to grab something that's interesting, obviously, and take him back and put it on his machine. So he creates virus Bob execute, and because when he, the file's there, it's got to do something. So he says, I'm going to let it launch uh, the calculator. The guy will probably think, what the hell, this is kind of an error in here. I'll close it out, and that way it's on there. Um, he's going to include this polymorphic routine to ensure the copy of it uh, does not launch it every time. And the plan is he does some research, and he finds that there's this uh, this Trojan called Brador. I'm from near uh, Canada. I always thought Brador was a beer. So I kind of thought this was pretty cool. Um, and this, so he's going to do this. It's going to made up, and it's going to get put on his victim's machine, and that's the direction he's going to do. As part of it, to summary of this, he's going to you know, kill the Bob server execute that was put on there, rename it, put it in here, and you guys probably understand this a lot more than I do. My previous demonstration or, or pitch, you guys didn't have to read. I'm, I'm making you read this time. Sorry about that. Uh, so you guys understand this. So he's going to plant this out there and hope that the guy will take it, and away we go. As part of that, he's going to get notified when it goes and executes. He's going to create the backdoor server. So basically what he's going to do is put the backdoor and the Trojan on his, this guy's machine so he can connect to it and start taking information off of it. Is there any problem here so far as far as violating the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act? Who thinks so? Well, see, that's, that's the aspect of it. Um, you know, yeah, he, he's clearly going down that path. What choice does he have? I, I mean, he doesn't know where the attack's coming from. Doesn't he have the right to find out where that attack's coming from? So, and, and is this proportional to what's happened to him? So we're still operating within that self-defense aspect of life in terms of proportional, timely uh, uh, in the response. Now, this is a crime. But again, is this a defense to it? Now, one other aspect I didn't point out about doing something like this. Um, lawyers all think the same way, defense lawyers all think the same way about one aspect with their client. At the end of the day, when the verdict comes back, um, the defense attorney is going to go home and have a steak dinner with a nice glass of red wine and the fact that the client might be going to jail and under a suicide watch for the next 72 hours, actually, you know, he's going to go home and have that glass of red wine. So this is something you want to think about. So this is the aspect of is this a defense and are we going to do it? So our guy here is going to send it out. And the plan, after the reboot, he'll have the uh, FTP server on there and he'll have access and he's going to put the hard reset on there uh, the next time he reboots. So the day comes, he hops back on the metro, he starts playing snails, and he gets the alert that everything's going fine. So he connects to the victim's PDA, or the, the attacker does, and on there he put a, a mini stumbler on there, which, again, I, I think that's pretty cool. You know, it would get me, it probably wouldn't catch you guys, but it would get me. And he executes it, and up comes the calculator. He's kind of like, well, that's weird. So, uh, you know, he turns it off, but the victim has everything the guy wanted on his machine. So the next day, it didn't go quite exactly as he wanted, but the next day, um, the alert comes in, he's got the back door, and this is how the scenario goes in the book. I quickly scanned the My Documents folder and downloaded a few files of interest. All right, any problems there? I have a question for you. If you want to find out who your attacker is on this, and you've got access, what's a better way to do it? Come on, guys, detectives, what, what, what's any other way better? Address book, good one. 
that you know that's what my uh, um, that's what my lawyers at uh, our criminal shop that I work with tell me you know look at the registry to find out if they've done that now see I'm a stupid enough user that on my palm you know it's, I, I fill it out you know the owner of this is you know Bob Clark cell phone number thinking that good Samaritans that find it might return it um, but you know the other aspect is because my handspring is like you know 50 years old so why wouldn't you return it um, uh, given, given what's going on uh, on that so that's what all my law enforcement guys say you know do the search not and in going into my documents but the registry or something like that to get the information something a little less requiring work the authentication keys for the OS And so you take that, give that to the cops, and they can trace them to find out where they're at. You're done. You've done your forensics, and away you go. And both on your computers, both are bogus. Outstanding. He has two. Anybody got three? Four? Do I hear four? Four. Five. Five. Do I see five? Sorry. Um, <laughs> anybody will admit it uh, um, on that. So he goes into my documents, looks at a couple things. Um, jumped into the compact flash card and found several copies of my log files. All right, self-help. Can he delete those? Personally, I think so. Um, this got into an aspect where I was just up at Harvard with a bunch of uh, maybe smart folks, maybe not. And there was a guy from DOJ Canada there. And we started talking about self-help, as lawyers are wanting to do. And he was like, I don't understand why you'd even want self-help. I said, okay. I'm a corporation, I have trade secrets, and one of my guys is monitoring the logs and sees that I've got data exfiltration going out, and in that, it's going to, it's going to an anonymous FTP. Of course, that's what my guy's telling me. And actually, in my logs, he's seeing the FTP with the password to get in, so as the guy sees it goes out, he grabs the uh, password to the FTP, goes to the FTP site, which just happens to be belonging to a US corporation, logs into it, uses the password to retrieve the stolen trade secrets on that, elevates his privileges so he can wipe the logs. No, wait, actually in the scenario, the guy didn't elevate his privileges because he didn't wipe the logs, and that's how they traced it back to the guy who did it, who had a problem with that. But if I'm smart, I'm going to elevate my uh, privileges, wipe the logs. I've got my trade secrets back, self-help, what's the problem? And the guy from DOJ Canada goes, hey, I didn't think about that. That's a good scenario. Um, so, you know, that's again, coming back from a corporate world, how that would play out and what's going on. Um, but in this one, so he's deleting those files, which I think, you know, is a defense, he has the right to do. They belong to me, it's my chattel, why can't I get rid of them? He pops over to the internal storage folder and once again cherry picks a few interesting files, again. Um, but then he deletes the contents of the folder. Um, you're starting to get out of the proportional aspect of things here. Um, and the final act is he uploads the hard reset execute uh, into the startup folder, which will completely wipe the PDA on a reboot. Um, interesting aspect of this. Now, from a proportional aspect of life, we talked about the different ways to find out who this belongs to. You know, the My Documents might be a real good way to find out, you know, who, you know, has a guy signed some documents, the gal signed some documents to find out the identity of this individual. So if you can get the identity from this individual on that aspect of it, before you put the hard reset on there, you know, and he goes and gives it to the cops, and the cops can go do the knock on the door with the subpoena and the affidavits to search, because kind of based on the forensics this guy did, you know, they've got the, the affidavit there, the search warrant going, bust the guy, collect up all his computer information, you might be able to do something with that. Of course, now the guy who's doing all this, what's he gonna say? I didn't do any of this. This guy put all this stuff on my machine. And that's probably what the feds are going to say. Forensically speaking, you've dorked around with this guy's system so much, I have no chain of custody on this one, so I really can't prosecute this. The other aspect about this, is this going to become public information? Is the guy, when he does a hard reset and loses his little PDA device, going to go running to DOJ or law enforcement and say, hey, I've been hacked, I lost all this stuff. Oh, well, what were you doing? Oh, I was hacking that mother... Uh, that other, that gentleman, 
and when this happened to me. So again, another aspect in the, in the field there, you know, am I going to be sued? Is there going to be a criminal case? You know, how is this all going to play out? In the scenario on this one, um, the final chapter on this is a, a knock knock from the cops and uh, they say we have a warrant for your arrest because apparently the attacker posted a copy of his uh, My uh, Virus Bob Execute online and since he had signed the code with a small note to the attacker, it wasn't very hard for the feds to track him down um, on that one. It's kind of an interesting aspect when we talk about doing these kind of things and these kind of devices out there. In the real world, the aspect is, are you liable for someone else's crimes? So if you take someone else's code that they've done and you use it, is the person who wrote that code going to be liable for your acts? And that could they be criminally charged? The ca closest thing we've got are, are gun cases, actually, where owners of guns have left unsecured guns out and either there's a kind of a divided line between knowing that people with violent tendencies get their hands on their gun and go out and shoot somebody. And there's a case that really just came out in Boston, or I think of Massachusetts, where the gun owner had secured the gun in uh, a locked cabinet and his stepson, who was an adult, was 19 years old, but had some violent psychological aspects in the past the guy should have known about or knew about, didn't take the keys and open the thing. He undid the screws on the cabinet to open up the case, took the gun, went out and shot a cop. And the, the wife's, wife of the cop brought a lawsuit against the parents uh, for the criminal act in civil court to get damages. And they held, yes, you should be civilly responsible for that because you knew the stepson had viable, uh, violent propensities and he didn't take enough steps to secure that weapon. So my question becomes, if you got code and it's part of your job to write code and experiment with them in closed environments, what steps do you need to take on your computers to protect it to make sure somebody doesn't get access to it? And it's just something kind of throw out there. And the answer to that is uh, it depends. So uh, on this one, the manufacturers of the weapons on that one. Again, coming back to the, the code aspect that people are stealing, you are the manufacturer of that code. When now, which comes back to, okay, did I modify the code or did I write the whole code? And, and, and again, this, I don't know, you, you tell me, I'm seeing the guy who writes that code as the manufacturer of the gun. Now, the, you know, they're not, you know, that's a, that's actually that's a good one on, on that aspect, except the line stops with the guy who manufactures the code. Yeah, there's another line behind the gun owner, but that's the other aspect. You write the code and you're, you're you know, you're in the security field and it's a great zero day exploit and you've tested it in your lab and everything and you're checking with a buddy and he says, well, you know, you go here, try, d you know, do, do an assessment on this one. See if your, your systems are going off, see if you can pick it up. So you give it a to a buddy to use, puts it on his or her machine, and someone hacks that machine and takes it out and uses it. Who's liable now? It depends. And again, it, it comes back to what did, because that's the first thing, and again, we're talking, I'm talking about the civil aspect of life as opposed to criminal. Because typically, typically, we are not liable for someone's criminal acts, third party criminal acts. There are a lot of exceptions to that. Um, but again, it depends. You got to know, there's a bunch of facts. How, how, what aspects did that individual take when you pass the weapon uh, to that individual? What did they take to secure it? What, you know, how were they handling that aspect of it? You know, the person who took it, again, what was the skill of the person who took it to get around the protection that person put on there? So again, a whole bunch of factors to look at in terms of what gets out there for that. Yes? So, I mean, the comparison aspect of kitchen knives, you know, and, and int there's an interesting aspect about that because there are 
Um, a lot of good self-defense cases dealing with kitchen knives. Um, so, you know, I'll have to look into that and see if I can't, you know, parlay some over into the, uh, the other aspect of the world there. Well, yeah, and, and I don't want to, you know, get off track on the, on the gun manufacturer's aspect, but one of the aspects you've got to look at when you're doing, you know, your job in security is how well you are securing the things that you've got on there and what people could be getting in their hands to be used. And you guys are the experts, so you'd have to tell me how much of your stuff, you know, can be traced back to you with signatures uh, on that aspect. Some things are very easy to trace back to you. Other things, you know, from what I tell in your field are, are not so easy to trace back. Um, so that's kind of the first scenario I was looking at. The reason I like that one is because it does work with also kind of changing your device to a Wi-Fi um, on that. This next one's going to kick my ass. Um, this is uh, trying to get uh, um, into a kind of a dog fight. Now, what I'm being told by most corporations in their systems and their intrusion detection aspect of life, um, the defender in this one was told to actually start developing strike back technologies for his firm. So he's already thinking ahead of this. Um, most of the stuff I'm told is done retroactively. You don't usually see the dog fight and have things there because most of the defense systems are passive defenses where they go off after someone's come in a signature or an IP address. Um, but this guy has, uh, this one's been, uh, this is a scenario written by uh, Harun, uh, I think it's Mir and Rolif uh, Terming, if I'm getting that right. I apologize if I'm not. And so they're looking at some actually doing some active defenses. And so I apologize when I butcher the technology on this one, but I will do my best. It's going to start off with um, the attacker trying to gather some intel on what he's looking for because he's been hired to find some specific information on hydrogen fuel cells. This could be any corporate information in the world that someone could be hired to target. So it could be trade secrets, it could be, you know, go get me the Coke trade secrets. So um, go get me next year's model for the Dodge Challenger that's coming out. So it's kind of an interesting aspect for that. And, and after doing his intel, you know, his aspect points towards um, this company called Primalis. I, I like this one because in, in the book um, they used, he starts talking about uh, good old Jules here and the line he used to use before he'd whack somebody, which was probably my favorite scene in, in Pulp Fiction. Um, you know, when he says, I will lay down with a vengeance. It's kind of like, you know, it's, it's pretty cool because he thought it was cool shit to say before he popped a cap in somebody. Um, and on this, so what he's going to do is he's going to populate his DNS zone um, with two million uh, different entries some with uh, some nice, you know, three little agencies on this one. And, you know, you guys, the reason I like this one is because he says nobody would ever legally get to the really key entries in here um, because he was going to make the top three machines in the 11 network with some special reverse NS, uh, NDS entries. Um, again, I'm a lawyer, so I'm reading through this, trying to grasp this as best I can. And when I had my techies at work start looking at this, they started laughing out loud. And because I was not really aware of what the uh, RM-RF and all that aspect was really going to do. And then they explained it to me. I thought, oh, shit, that's pretty cool um, on this. And the reason I like this is because uh, when he explained it to me, when you're, you're doing your reverse DNS lookup, information is going to start flowing back, and he's requesting this information, and it's going to melt his machine. So am I sending or am I transmitting this code out there? I'm not. I just got it sitting there. Somebody's going to come and grab it. Have I transmitted any code out there to melt this guy's machine? My argument would be no. I, I, you know, I didn't. Now, what's my intent? My intent's to wipe his machine. But the other aspect on this is he, you know, he says, you know, nobody would ever get to this. You know, if they got to this, this is somebody with a malicious intent. Right. Oh, okay. So a couple aspects here. Do I have a victim? No, I'm not going to have a victim because this guy's hacking. So he's not like he's going to run to LEA and, and law enforcement and say, "Hey, this guy just melted my machine." Um, so I did like this. It's proportional. It's staying within his system, 
So arguably, you could say, hey, it's just self-defense. Again, I've got a hacker that gets attributed special skills and knowledge, so anything he grabs and brings back, hey, he's liable for it. It's his or her mistake. They're responsible. You know, so I, I do kind of like that aspect on it. And again, my techies like this one, so they explained it to me, and, and I enjoyed it. Self-defense, will that hold up in court? Um, the, co the conference that I was at um, that had, that we got into this help, help com conversation, I asked a representative of DOJ, was he aware of anybody being prosecuted for an active response? And he said, I'm not aware of any case whatsoever. The, the question is, is this the same as RIAA going after people to delete their files and, and the root kit that was put on there? Is this kind of the same thing, self-help aspect of it? And specifically going after music and everything. Would, would that be, would, was what RIAA doing, was that self-help? Was that an active response? Who here says yes? Okay. You know, ask EFF, they're going to tell you, yes, it was. Now, were they prosecuted? Well, they're pursuing some legislation. Are you talking about the root kit that they put on there? I mean, because, well, that actually is self-help. I mean, that's DRM. That's monitoring that way. But, you know, that was actually, you know, putting spyware on there. That seems to me to be quite the aspect of self-help. Um, go ask DOJ why they weren't prosecuted. Um, it's reasonable. No, wait, wait, wait. I didn't, get, I didn't express an opinion on that. Uh, see, now, don't jump to the conclusion that I'm saying RIA was correct in doing that, okay? If it seems reasonable to put it there, you're assuming your clients are going to steal something or do something malicious with it, preemptive. Preemptive self-defense. Wait, preemptive self-defense. Okay, I can't go there. I work for that guy. And the last guy who commented about somebody being a general in Air Force, had stars, and said something about a president doing something, he was showing the door really fast. I have no stars on my shoulders whatsoever. So we won't go there um, on this. The questions are very valid in what you're asking. And, it, and it's all that aspect of it depends on this one. Question back here. Banners. Is that what you're talking about? Banners about different? Signs warning someone to come into my property. Okay. My house. Do I have a trespass sign on my house? But if I have attack dogs. Um, I've got this great lab. She's wonderful. And uh, she'll bark, but then she'll show you where the china is, of course, um, on that one. So, um, again, attack dogs, this aspect. Again, my aspect to defend my property has to be reasonable in what I'm doing and what I'm setting up. You guys are the experts, so I'm going to go back. Um, on this one, he populates it with two million entries for, uh, for this. Is it going to take some time for you guys to get through that stuff to find out what's real and what's not? Yes or no? I see some heads nodding. Nobody wants to split my fee and step up and say, yeah, it's going to take time on this. It depends. I like that one. That's a good one. But I'm sorry. I thought this was a hard science. I didn't think you guys could say that. Um, from what I understand for the scenario, to get through the real ones, he's got to run a script to filter out the bad ones and get to the real ones. And, and again, I'm, I'm going off of this that basically it, it said in here when I read it, this is going to take some real malicious intent to get here. And that's kind of the aspect that you're going to look at when you're doing this. I'm going to go back to the question of when I asked DOJ, has anybody ever been prosecuted for an active response? He said he wasn't aware of a case. Um, public knowledge. There's a case out of the Eastern District of Virginia where the prosecutor in the Eastern District of Virginia um, declined to prosecute um, an active response uh, case on this. So I am aware of one where the prosecutor declined to 
prosecute it. It's the only one I'm aware of um, on that. Um, so I would like to, you know, try to do this as best I can and continue on with this scenario. Um, where am I with Nathan? Nathan starts doing his lookup, and he's noticing that it's big. Uh, 17 megabytes, he's like kind of uh, surprised this is going on. He's noticing a lot of duplicates, um, so he's going to, you know, type in a command to kind of try to get through that, and he finds apparently um, 11,310 unique DNSs, uh, and he goes through this, and he starts digging through some stuff, and the reason I go through this is maybe you guys understand this better than I do. I'm sure you do, because as he goes through this, all of a sudden, the book says, he looked at his screen, his eyes become watery, felt his heart pumping ice cold water, and he knew the feeling all too well, and he jumped across there and started pulling the ethernet cord from his firewall, knocking over coffee, and found out he had been had um, on this one. And then using, uh, he, he analyzes the list, notices, he, he catches with his eyes the, uh, the, the RM-RF in there, um, and laughed about it um, on this. In this scenario, it keeps going on, and these guys start discovering um, that this is going on, that they're going back and forth. And so on this one, he, the next thing is the guy, he, he messes with his IP tables um, to kind of look at, uh, deal with the NMAP, and he puts um, some listeners out there on this. So the next connection, when the guy does this, you know, they'll be, he'll get more, again, an announcement. They start sending emails back and forth so they know what's going on. He realized there's a honeypot going on there, which is pretty good. Um, and from this, they start going back and forth. Now, one of the things the guy does at the end here is he uh, creates, you know, you guys will understand this a lot better than I will. I'll let you look at these things going through here because I want to get kind of to the last aspect where um, he creates the new directory, and the guy does steal the data. And that's how he gets rid of them. He does get had. He loses his directory. He populates it here, and the guy steals a bunch of documents. Now, the hacker was hired to get information on hydrogen fuel cells. And when he goes in this file, he sees a lot of technical stuff, so he just grabs it, wraps it up, sends it up to the guy who hired him, and away he goes. Well, when the guys open up the file back at their corporation, um, it gets a nice little message saying, you're owned, and their entire systems lock up right from there. Um, which, again, is that proportional to what's going on. Um, the question becomes, they go through a bunch of scenarios in this back and forth, defenses, re-defenses, the dogfight imaging that's going on. So my question becomes, this guy didn't go away. So is this proportional or not? How much is the data worth? You know, the idea is that's, you know, that's a good question. What are you trying to get to? What are you trying to defend? And this is a corporation, so let's say trade secrets. And, you know, and the aspect is, does it have to be, you know, worth $5,000 or $5 million? That's going to, again, again, those factors are going to depend on how big I am. Am I a mom and pop shop that's working on, you know, a specific government contract that if I lose this, Northrop Grumman or Boeing or somebody's going to grab, you know, for that aspect. So it, it does come into play there. So what can I do? How far can I go to get rid of someone who's persistent? You know, and if I'm your lawyer, I'm going to say pretty damn far. The guy didn't go away. You put all the experts up there to show all the different techniques they were using, all the things I did. Now, the other aspect about this active response, the other argument is everything I did was internally. I personally didn't send anything out. Yes, I intentionally wrote stuff so when the guy grabbed it, he'd take it back. Again, one of the things I want to say is, hey, special skills. I can't, you know, it's not my fault the guy sucks. All right? <laughs> if he's going to bring this stuff back and open it on his machine, that's his problem, not mine. Now, the question becomes, I'll get to you in a second. I asked some guys, could this be launched from an innocent third party? Could all these commands and all this? In the scenario in the book, you know, it, it's the Linux aspects that he's running from his box and his machine. So the question becomes, if I'm doing this from an innocent third party, what's my liability if I fry their machines? What if the server is from Citibank, is the, with the argument we always hear, 
and you know their their server goes down and they lose millions of dollars. My favorite one is, what if I am Citibank, and my guy's doing active response, and he goes and fries the innocent third party machine, and that innocent third party machine is a Chase Manhattan machine. What does that now look like in the press? You know, Citibank fries Chase Manhattan highlights at seven. Now the downside is you're going to have DOJ knocking on your door. The good side is think of all the new customers you're going to be getting from Chase coming over to Citibank. <laughs> so there's that plus and that minus thing that you're going with there. Your question. And that's, you know, it's funny. The, the question is the robbing of the bank and the ink thing, you know, going off on you. Those, th and that's the aspect. That physical world case you're just talking about where the ink thing explodes all over them and they can find them, that is exactly when, we, when lawyers start getting into this area, that's exactly what we start talking about in terms of the, isn't that, isn't this the ink thing exploding to protect my trade secrets? Now, a couple aspects on that. This scenario and the PDA scenario. The PDA scenario identified who it was. Yeah, well, you, you, I'm gonna say, he really didn't find out or do anything with the information that he obtained on that one. So there's that. So your scenario is, if I'm getting the information, do I have to hard kill this person's operating system to gather information for that red dye to be all over me? You know, the aspect is he's killing the machine. Now the question becomes, all right, Am I going to find out where this person is, or can they are they coming in such a non at, uh, attributable line that I'm never going to really find who this is? So the aspect becomes: Can I get attribution? Because again, you guys are the experts. Are you ever going to open up something on your box that's going to be a web bug or a beacon that's going to give me your real IP address? So I'm going to know where you're at, and I can find you. I would hope any self-respecting hacker would not. You never know. Um, I've been told, you know, yeah, I might get some low-hanging fruit, but not the real top dog, top dog guys. So there's that aspect. So in this scenario, it's kind of that aspect where, you know, I can't find where this is coming from. I've got a persistent threat, so, you know, the hard kill on the machine. You know, this particular scenario, the, the stealing of the trade secrets, was the guy going away? No, he kept coming back, coming back. The only time he went away was when he got data and left. You know, real world, if you really want to be malicious, you get the data, the guys are looking at it actually that, that hired the hacker, they know it's shit, they're going to go, what are they going to do? Come on, you know, yeah, baseball bats come out, let me introduce you to my little friend. Um, <laughs> yeah, that or call the guy back and say, get back at it, or find someone better, which means this company has a persistent threat that they have to respond to. And those persistent threats seem to be a reason for why you should be able to respond. <coughs> Building a booby trap on your property. Um, you know, that's, you know, with law, you get in the, a lot of these debates and you, you know, get all the lawyers sitting around the table and that's where the honeypot aspect starts coming up that that's entrapment. Um, and I know a lot of uh, Rich Delgado, who works for Yahoo now, was in DOJ and wrote the legal section on um, the aspect. By the way, you're staying here of your own free will right now. So if you want to get up and go, go ahead. We're past our time. Um, and so I need someone go get me a beer because now I can drink um, on this one. Because now I'm on my own. I could drag for a little bit. Um, the aspect on a honeypot and entrapment, um, that argument coming up, it, it's always been, I've always heard it thrown up there. Now, the question becomes the aspect of, if I've got my network there that's being mapped out and I'm leaving things clearly vulnerable to direct you into that, is that entrapment to get in there? Um, I would say no, because the aspect of entrapment has to be, you can't be predisposed to commit this crime. Um, now, if, I, you know, if I'm law enforcement and I build this out there, and then I go into all the IRC chat rooms and I start going, hey, you know, this whole, you know, IP address over here, it's easy, it's been compromised, go use it, it's got these vulnerabilities, hop on in there. That's starting to get more from a law enforcement perspective under the definition of entrapment. Remembering, of course, I'm not your lawyer and I'm not giving you any legal advice. <laughs> well, 
Well, yeah, and, and that's the aspect that he's saying. Entrapment is typically a problem if you're the government doing it as opposed to a private person. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, but, you know, the question became the entrapment aspect. And again, that's not so much an issue unless I'm out there, you know, from a government perspective, advertising to come on into that. So. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm really going to have to embarrass myself here. Um, the guy said something about the cuckoo eggs. And uh, um, Well, now, okay, well, it's an interesting point that's coming out on this one uh, because it comes actually into computer network defense. There is a line when you're defending your network um, and you have a threat and you see it and you tell the cops about it, and especially under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act with the computer trespass exception, the cops being able to come in and now immediately start monitoring that and watch what's going on with the trespasser coming in. System administrators, when they're doing forensics, have got to be careful because if you're doing your own system uh, forensics for defense, you're entitled to do that. If you start acting at the discretion or the direction of law enforcement, you, Fourth Amendment protections can be put on top of you and you can become a pseudo law enforcement officer. And so what you do in terms of what you're downloading, the evidence that you get, if you don't uphold the Fourth Amendment, can be suppressed in court um, from a Fourth Amendment perspective. The nice thing about the Electronic uh, Communication Privacy Act, if you violate that or cops violate that, the remedy is not that the evidence will be thrown out in court. Um, it still comes in. It's you get to civilly go sue the cop and get damages from the cop for doing it. Kind of a neat, interesting aspect on that. And there, there actually was a case where because um, cops did that, they violated the Electronic Communication Privacy Act in a kidnapping case. And the kidnapper sued them. Um, and won the case. I don't think got any money, uh, but won the case uh, on that. So that's a, kind of an issue. But as a system provider, if you start acting at the directions of a cop, um, you could violate the Fourth Amendment and make the cop's case all screwed up. You know, aspect of that. signature all right sorry sorry my aspect this is a soft kill so when they reboot everything's back up so blue screen of death do you okay so you're gonna and, and the, uh, I'm going to try to do this again. So basically, someone's scanning your system for a vulnerability that's been out there for a long time. You know it's there. You want to put a decompression bomb in there to give them a blue screen of death when they're doing it uh, to stop them from doing it. Uh, scenario, I want you know, in case the guys in the back didn't hear it. Um, is that the least proportional aspect of thing you could do? Uh, see, here's the other aspect. Could you write a signature so when they do that and you see it, it directs them into a honeypot? And then you kind of let them just kind of fool around and do whatever they're doing while they're in there. Okay, so um, if that, you know, my little aspect is the signature to block that. You know, the blue screen of death, um, is that proportional? If it's a persistent problem? A and again, you know, like, like the, the gentleman behind me, it depends. Um, you know, if it's a persistent problem and you can show it's a persistent problem, 
Now here's the other aspect because I get this from, you know, from certain law enforcement lawyers all the time. Okay, is it a persistent problem? Can you show it? Can you show which IP addresses it's constantly coming at you from? Because we always get from a system to an administrator perspective, um, they always say, why don't you just block the IP when you see the vulnerability coming in? And I'm like, because I block the IP and then they come from 50,000 other IP addresses. What is wrong with you? Um, and uh, so that aspect, that pers persistent th threat, I'm going to guess there's something probably a little more tame you could do than that. Am I going to say you're outside the realm of proportionality? Again, no. As a lawyer, no, not at all. By all means, I'll go have my steak and red wine at the end of the day. Um, what, was, what was your intent for doing that? I mean, your intent was to have code go out there to their machine, and, and that's what happened. Are you legally responsible to patch? I can't answer that the way I really want to answer that um, on that. Um, again, the, that's kind of my aspect of third party liability. If I fire and melt somebody's machine because they didn't patch their boxes and someone compromised it and that's where they came at me from, and as a self-defense, I'm going to say, I, can't, I gotta stop the pain and you know, pull my plug, take me offline, is not stopping that persistence and, then, and your lawyer will say, well, go ahead and hit that box, then the third party wants to sue me for doing that. Th there's another theory in, in the world out there called contributory negligence and comparative negligence. They're two different standards. Um, and I apologize for not having looked at these uh, carefully. Compa one of them is if you're 51% at fault, you can't sue me. There's another one where it's, I'm sorry, if you're at 97.5% at fault, you can sue me and get that 2.5% of your recovery. Um, and uh, I, I was party to a great case on that where a gal sued for a bad haircut. Um, what happened was she was working on a routing machine and she, they rewired it to make it go faster to operate. It was a turret drill and it ripped her scalp off. Now, she, re, she jerry-rigged the machine to work faster, but the argument is the reason I did it was because my company wanted me to work faster. And they found product liability, which we don't, have in software, which someone else had asked before, um, uh, they found the company who made the machine was not liable for 97.5% and she was, you know, so they were still responsible for 2.5%. So that aspect on there is contributory negligence of an unsecured machine. What is your responsibility and your liability for that machine and what you've left vulnerable? In the back there, sir. Right. Okay, a, a couple aspects. I mean, it's good points when you're track when you're tracing it back and finding out. I mean, th these again. Th th that's why I went with scenarios where they had positive identification on on who they were dealing with attribution aspect. These are the arguments that always come up as far as attribution immediately, you know, getting that positive aspect and the fact that it goes outside the United States. Now, extraterritorial jurisdiction aspects of life, you strike back on a box outside the United States, it's still a violation of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Uh, so it's still, you know, a crime on that aspect. Again, don't need a victim because according to a lot of people, out, the state's the victim. I don't need to, you know, worry about that aspect of it. Yes? Now again, let's let's understand some aspects uh, on this. No, you know, to do all these things, the timeliness, the proportionable, reasonable use of force, all these aspects are the aspects of self-defense, self-help in the real physical world. All right. So far, doing this active response in the virtual world. Again, my DOJ guys are telling me. I'm not aware of any cases ever being prosecuted for this, but doing it is a crime. Now, I, I, I hope the videotape's still going uh, on this one, so that I started with that and can kind of go towards an end on that. Doing this is a crime. Now, again, the scenarios that I've used here were all things put on my machine, um, and they were gotten by a hacker and taken back. I mean, so again, the way you know computers work, you're going to say, "Hey, 
you came to me, that was consent. You consented to the secured socket with my machine, so you took it back. That was on you. The problem with that, of course, is what was your intent in putting it on my machine? Was it, you know, I intend to fry your machine, get, damn it, get away from me. Again, depending on, you got 50 prosecutors, 50 states with 50 U.S. attorneys with numerous prosecutors working for them. They want to make a name for themselves on something, you know, you don't want to be in the wrong jurisdiction. You know, yeah, that's that's the other aspect about this. A couple aspects of things. Active response is a crime. Yes and no. D you know, again, it depends where that line's going to come down to to just say where what is a permissible active defense and what's not. You touched on the other aspect on that too, which was when I go and do this, what have I just done to the law enforcement's case on this one? Are they going to be able to prosecute this guy? Does it make him any less, you know, less guilty? The aspect you've said, if I got this correctly, you want this. Is he less guilty? You know, again, no. I, I mean, and that's the aspect of what you have to work with, with what you want to do. And that's kind of the, you know, interesting. We, we, we sit there and we talk and we say, the question becomes, do you know anybody doing this? I, I personally don't. But you talk to guys in InfraGuard, which was set up to bring law enforcement and businesses and everything together, ask them, do you know any financial companies doing this? Do you know any corporations doing this? I don't know the answer to that. And it goes back to what you said. Does it make that individual any more or less guilty for hacking my box? And these are all aspects that as a system administrator or, or you know, someone who's running the IT section has to decide, what is my ultimate goal? Is it the persistent threat that I'm never going to get attribution on because, you know, there's too many people doing it. They're coming out. You know, what is my response to that? Is it the persistent threat that maybe I can get attribution and I think I'm getting it that I want to see a prosecution on? So that's how, you know, in the military, computer network defense is made up of multiple disciplines. It's kind of the same way in the private sector. I mean, in the military, it's, it's made up of system administrators, law enforcement, counterintelligence, and military operators, military operations. And they all bring their inherent authorities in to do this. Same thing in the private sector. It's made up of all those people too. And they all bring in their inherent capabilities or lack of them uh, together to bear on that problem. And the decision on what you want to do is one of those things that's worked out ahead of time. No, go, go.
the, uh, the question was, am I seeing any uh, laws that are kind of making the progression, keeping up to date with the technology, I think is the thing that was always said and asked. Um, interesting enough, I'm going to give an answer that's not mine, because um, that question was asked to uh, a DOJ attorney, and his answer on that one was typically um, no. Congress gets a bug up their butt on a specific issue, and you quickly see something done about it. Um, the Can Spam Act, um, spyware, something that comes up, and they immediately and very quickly rush it through. And the problem you have probably, or, or one, one of the aspects of it is, is explaining, trying to have them come up with laws and legislation that isn't going to be obsolete six months from now. Uh, and that's what they're really working very hard on, to write laws to capture an idea or the aspect of the virtual world that don't become obsolete because the technology changes. Uh, and that is a very difficult thing to do because your people writing these laws and writing these policies, very few of them are technical. I don't mean to put in a plug for DOJ here, but um, the CSIPS guys, the Computer Crimes and Intellectual Property section, have a lot of really sharp guys and gals who all have the computer science engineering undergraduate degrees. I wish I had their resumes because they've done the engineering and the technical stuff undergrad and they've gone on and got their law degrees so they understand it. And they're trying to help in the crafting and the writing of the legislation to kind of combat that. Um, but you typically in the legal field don't see that. Um, one of the areas that really had to develop to respond to a new invention was our tort law and our negligence and our product liability aspect when this new uh, really cool invention uh, came out that had four wheels and replaced a horse. And the, mm -hmm. the, the aspect of torts and negligence and product liability really had to grow and again you've got to take what was there and apply it to the car. And unfortunately that's the way the legal world works. I, I have a question. Well, and, you know, and that's, and you'll see, again, a lot, a lot of law review articles written about applying the physical aspects to the virtual world, going back and forth, arguing you'll never be able to do it. Yeah, you can do it. Yeah, it's a hybrid. I mean, uh, it's just, there's uh, a lot of reading on, on that aspect. All right. So, say you're a vendor that provides an active response or a library of active responses. Is there any concerns about liability providing more aggressive responses or even providing, an, say, an open toolbox to conduct all sorts of active or aggressive responses, or does this sort of fall under where there's no software liability? I'm talking sort of third-party liability. We give them the software and they you know, again, blow them up. if you're talking about having an anonymous FTP server with all the different technologies and code and everything written on there for anybody to get access uh, to. More of a, you, they pay us for, yeah. I'm sorry? More of a provided for a fee service software? Well, the mm -hmm. provided for a fee aspect always throws in a nice little, nice little twist in any analysis yeah. um, on that. And again, um, you're developing things that are going to be used by putting third parties' hands to use um, on that. It kind of goes back to the manufacturer question of, hey, I manufacture it, but he's using it. Am I criminally liable for a third party's act? Typically, you're on pretty safe grounds for not being liable for someone else's criminal acts um, from that aspect. Civilly, in a civil suit, that's a whole other question of risk management. And again, you know, the first question becomes, do I have any money? Would I be sued? <laughs> um, you know, and, and that's a different question from the civil aspect of it. Yeah. Yes? of the aspect of what I'm writing. 
you know, Microsoft writes an operating system there with vulnerabilities, okay, and they put it out there. You know, let's cover you know, end user agreements and all the aspects that we have out there going on for the software. You writing something with the intent that's an active response, again, the intent changes on that, and, and that can be the, one of the key linchpins on what's going on with that. Again, I assume you are a, uh, a self-respecting security specialist, so your systems are going to be hardened, so anybody who gets to you and takes anything off your system, you'll be able to stand up and say, I not only secured it as reasonably as any reasonably prudent person in the public sector would be, because judge, look at the idiot users that we've got out there, you can't even turn your computer on, um, to I've taken these steps to secure it even further. I think it's Miller time. Come down here for the quick questions. 